So welcome everyone. I, I trust we're all friends now, but just in case we've got any new arrivals to our conversations. Uh, my name is Clara Marnie. I'm chair of the Design History Society, and I'm very much looking forward um, to our, our conversation uh, further part of the Gender in Design Hidden Histories seminars. Um, it's my great delight to have had the opportunity to forge these with um, our DHS ambassador, Alex Bannister, who will be introducing all of our speakers this evening. Uh, but just by way of initial preliminary, we've been talking around methodological issues so far. We've been thinking through localities of hidden histories in terms of professional and pedagogic contexts. Our focus tonight is really flipping the lens to reflect on how these are captured, preserved, lost or, or recalibrated within the context of archival habits of curation and guardianship. So we really look forward to thinking through how this operates in a variety of different contexts um, this evening, both in terms of media, but also intellectual traditions. Um, so without further ado, I will just move forward and having had all of you um, join with sound, I just need to unmute each of the speakers as we go. So I'm just asking Alex to unmute now to, to be able to speak. Over to Alex. Thank you, Claire. Hello, everyone. Warm welcome to this evening's uh, Hidden History Seminar. Uh, the format of the evening is that each speaker will speak for about 10 minutes, and this will be followed by a group Q&A at the end. Uh, so please pop any questions that you have in the chat box, and these will be discussed um, at the end of the evening. Um, I interviewed a few of our speakers tonight for the Design History Society blog, so more information about their research can be found on our website. Um, but let's begin. Um, our first speaker is Ellen Manker, Assistant Professor in Art History and Visual Studies at Umeå University in Sweden. Ellen's research concerns design and craft history and theory with a particular interest in how theories of um, aesthetics intermingle with design and craft practices. I'll hand over to you now, Ellen. So oh, thank you so much for having me as speaker at this virtual seminar series. Uh, and my talk today concerns the importance of archives, or more specifically, the effect on research due to what is saved in archives and what is not saved. We know since long that women's life and work to a lesser extent than men's has been saved for various reasons, who had the power to collect or to be head of collections or to write history, etc. In the same way as other subordinated groups in society, women have not, especially historically speaking, had the interpretive precedence to decide what is to be left for coming generations. That archives are crucial for research uh, and to point at difficulties to tell gender histories when the traces are absent or rare is of course not a new or a radical claim. But as we could see in the talk of last week's seminar, for those of you who had the possibility to attend, the claim is still worth doing. And in this paper, I thus want to remind ourselves of two things in relation to hidden histories and gender in design. And the first one is that there are still findings to be done in the archives. There are still hidden histories to be told. And I will reflect upon this point by sharing my present research project on a Swedish woodcarver, textile designer and arts and craft entrepreneur, Selma Jöbel, working around the turn of the century 1900. And the other thing I want to pose as a reminder, and which I will come to in the end of this talk, is a reflection about what we are doing today, not to leave the archives of present days as empty on gender issues as our forerunners did. And in this part, I will rely on a book published last year, in Swedish though, Archivism, which called for a movement to make contemporary women start document and save their lives and works. But first, my uh, project on Selma Jöbel. You have now looked a while on this rug and perhaps reflected on the information you have on the slide. It's a huge rug, it's hand knotted and it has an intriguing design considering it's made 1909. However inspiring it would be to talk more about Jöbel's specific designs, this talk is about archives or the lack of archives. So we have to leave this rug just as one example of what advanced work Selma Jöbel did perform. And I can have the next slide please. 
So Selma Jöbel had a much successful career and were a prominent figure for what was a Swedish equivalent uh, with the arts and craft movement in Britain. Uh, yet she's almost totally left out of the history of Swedish design. On this slide, you can see some of uh, what her performed during her life. Uh, it was prime education, travels abroad, two successful enterprises, and not the least, she was spoken about in her own time as pioneering or the best representative of national designs and so forth. This all means Selma Jöbel was the kind of person you would have imagined been included in history. So why is she not? We could think of a couple of reasons, but at least two are connected to the archival situation. The first one is pragmatic. Selma Jöbel did not set up, collect or organize an archive. Neither did any relatives or patrons of hers. We can only speculate today why this is the case. Uh, and it's easy to think of gender reasons. Did she perhaps not have the self-confidence to make an archive? Or rather, was it at the time not even something that you would think of as a woman? To make an archive, that was men's business, so to speak. Unluckily, also Selma Jöbel's estate were destroyed in a fire about 10 years after her death. So this prospect for remembering her work has thus not been good. But every now and then objects appear in the archives. The top picture shows pattern sheets from Jöbel's uh, enterprise that has been lying unregistered at the regional museum since the 1970s. Only a couple of years ago, some of them were photographed and digitalized why I found them and could start this project. It's still a mystery, however, why they were left at this museum in a part of the country to which she had no connection. Anyhow, the other reason why Selma Jöbel had been hidden in history has to do with the fact that textual sources normally have stronger position in archives than, for instance, unrecognized patterns as those mentioned above. Also, work and everyday life normally are harder to save and find in archives. In an earlier project I conducted that included some of the front figures of early women's emancipation in Sweden, I was struck by the fact that what was not the big deal in about 1860 to 1890 was the question of the right to vote, at least not in Sweden, a question we are used to see as the central one. Instead, the right to work, to be able to enroll in edu any education, to earn your living and the right to keep your income, even if married, were the main tasks. And why the right to vote was not that important, I think has to do with the fact that neither all men had the right to vote. That happened only in 1907 in Sweden. Being part of society, having some sort of influence were earlier connected to work, to money and to own property. Even for men, that was the basis for being included. Only with a certain amount of money, also men had the right to vote. So for these early women's emancipators in Sweden, work, education and having your own money were the position to secure. It's meaningful here, I think, to recall such, such research conducted as, for instance, by Alice Kessler Harris already in the 1980s, where she speaks of a different kind of, of different kinds of citizenship. Kessler Harris argues for a knowledge of what she calls the economical citizenship to have influence uh, in the more everyday sense, you also need to have the economical property to act in society. It is not enough with the right to vote once every third or fourth year. Still today, when women might have the right to vote in many countries, they can make, be excluded from impact on their everyday situation since they do not have the same means, economically speaking, as men. They might be hindered by motherhood to, take, to make career, their salaries are not equal, etc. Standing on equal terms economically is what Caris Hessler identifies with economical citizenship, and that is needed, she claims, for an equal citizenship in society. And this situation was similar in the 19th century, when hardly no rights whatsoever were at hand for women, the starting point for the emancipating struggle was to paid work and higher education. That was the logical first step on the way to a more equal society. But work does not, as said, always leave clear traces in the archives. Neither does the more everyday business of working, as opposed to the more dramatic actions that many suffragettes performed. Selma Jöbel uh, was not a woman, woman of words. She was, however, associated with the women's emancipation movement, but did not put herself on the barricades. 
She did not write articles or debated uh, in the papers. Instead, she did exactly what the movement asked for. She worked. She made her own living, set up her own enterprise, and she hired other women. She enabled others to work. And to make a long story a bit shorter, what makes Selma Jöbel prominent in a gender perspective is not her aesthetics or ability as a designer, but that she shaped her own career as crafting and designing woman, and that craft and design was, thus, an occupation where women back then had some possibilities to take place in society at a more equal basis as men. And importantly, Selma Jöbel were not an exception, but quite many women entered the paid working scene from second half of the 19th century onwards. They have, nevertheless, probably not gained enough attention since few traces are left of them in the archives. And however, by working, Selma Jöbel was a good example for the contemporary emancipators to report on. And that is the main reason why we know anything of her today. Journals, especially women's journals, wrote about her made, her, made a point of her as a guiding example of a working woman. Uh, when she left no archive herself, these articles have been my way into her career, a career that is both interesting for design history as such and for gender history at large. And the next slide, please. And the case of Selma Jöbel makes me think of today. What do we do to leave traces of women and gender issues from our contemporary history in the archives? Do we even, as historians, have any obligation here to make the contemporary woman saving bits and pieces of her lives for the future understanding of gen the gender situation of the early 21st century? I think we do, in the sense that we experience the problem of scarce archives. We understand how forgotten and hidden histories can be. Uh, this is why I want to conclude with a suggestion that comes from a couple of journalists in Sweden in the recent book. They urge each and everyone to start archives. Why should we not? Or our sisters? Or our mothers-in-laws? Why should not all of us be worthy a place in history? Nobody knows what will be interesting in the future, hence we need to start take action, Tom Scord and Poussette argues. The book Archivism is turned towards the greater public to use the 19th century expression and includes a presentation on what is an archive, how to collect and how to order, how to make interviews, etc. It's very practical and hands-on. But there might also be other things to do. And for instance, statistics from Wikipedia from 2019 reveals that 90% of the entries and editorial work of Wikipedia is made by men only 10% by women. What does that mean for the kind of subjects and information searchable? I have a colleague actually that introduced Wikipedia editing as a part of a course, just to encourage students to take part in the forming of a general knowledge on our time. Just as we look in popular press of the 19th century to get a varied picture of things back then, it is likely to say that if the internet survives as a searchable source, the future will look at Wikipedia for trying to understand what we today thought were interesting, how we explained things, etc. And then gender issues might be hidden if sources like Wikipedia is more or less only edited by men. And with this suggestion to us design historians and designers to also think of what kind of archives we leave for the future, to think of how we are part of shaping what is left of us and how that could be different from how gender histories were left in earlier days. With this suggestion, uh, I would like to thank you for listening. Thank you, Ellen, for starting us off. Um, our next speaker tonight is Dina Bembrahim. Dina is Assistant Professor of Graphic Design at the University of Arkansas, and her research looks at visibility, civic action, and social justice, particularly in relation to marginalized communities. Uh, welcome, Dina. Thank you for having me today and the kind introduction. Actually, before we go to this slide, I would like to stay on the first one, on the introductory slide. Thank you. I'm really excited to share with you um, this work that I started about two years ago, and you know it's going to be super concise, 
uh, in three slides. Um, but, you know, in um, indigenous spaces, I think understanding craft as design really reveals new ways of um, knowing that are outside master narratives. I always thought it was kind of curious that the frame of Eurocentric graphic design uh, conceived craft to be unworthy of design. Um, and I actually think this is a very narrow uh, way of seeing what design is. Um, and so I'd like to speak about Amazir women who are indigenous to North Africa, and they have been leaders and uh, deities, goddesses, and agents of change in their communities since pre-Islamic times. And despite centuries and centuries of colonization and patriarchy, their legacy really survived in popular everyday life objects like rugs. And actually, Amazigh rugs appeared during the second millennium BC with a very unique knot and a geometric visual language that resembles modernist work, but it was way before modernism. And unfortunately, uh, there is a blatant lack of interest to uncover pre-Islamic symbology and even less to preserve the current stories of their visual language. And so it makes their heritage at a really great risk to um, be forgotten and be lost, which is, you know, just heartbreaking. Um, but we can't have a full understanding of the erasure of Amazigh symbology without exploring shortly the complex system that contributes to this cultural loss. And so if we go to the next slide, I'll speak about how the rug market is heavily gendered um, because it systematically denies women weavers access. And so there is less and less women weavers who want to be weavers. So imagine with me, if you had to perceive only 4% of your salary after working really, really hard, how would you feel? The situation is kind of similar. So to sell their rugs, most women weavers actually go to a market and they have no choice but to use two middlemen. There is one middleman called the Dlel. He grabs the rug, he walks a few feet from her and goes to another middleman who is called Sumsar. And he will actually buy the rug and sell it again to the end customer. 96% of the end profits go to this two middlemen, which leaves only 4% to the weaver. And when you do the math, the average that a woman weaver actually perceives is $1.2, which is inhumane. And this is the most common business model in Morocco. There is an alternative model to this one that existed for decades, which is the fair trade model, and it increases the weaver's profits to 20% instead of four, but it's still not enough to make a decent livelihood and even less to create meaningful change in the sector. So I worked with the ANU, um, which is an artisan-owned and artisan-managed e-commerce platform, and they introduced a new model in 2013. Um, it was founded with the goal to give power back to the weavers. And so their business model allows the weaver to perceive 100% of the profits and they add an additional 20% as a premium uh, that is incurred by the end customer, which means that, um, you know, they get to make a livelihood and they get to change uh, their lives that way. And the 20% is actually reinvested in the weavers communities. So it makes this a sustainable model. However, um, they're now working with 700 artisans out of the 425,000 artisans currently in Morocco. So there is a lot to be done. But let me unpack for a minute here to bring even more context to why Amazigh women are exploited. Among multiple historical facts, during centuries of colonization, uh, Morocco was actually under the protectorate of France and Spain. And so the protectorate initiated in 1914 uh, what we call the Native Arts Service. Uh, the aim was to reinvent Moroccan craft through the lens of colonial values and aesthetics. And it obviously contributed to the erasure of the Amazigh design storytelling. But worse, it gave the status of Amazigh women a one of non-elite, underrepresented minority. And so this frame led Amazigh women weavers to be exploited with really intensive low cost uh, labor and also confinement. 
Another fact to consider is that 70% of women artisans are actually coming from a rural background because they couldn't uh, receive um, a formal education there uh, due to a lack of infrastructure. And they are, um, because of that, constrained to the domestic space uh, where weaving is actually an acceptable uh, occupation in the eyes of patriarchal social norms. Um, and it's often taught from mother to daughter or through marriage. And another aspect of exploitation actually uh, happens in ministry run centers and rug making workshops, which are famously known to be um, sweatshops. Uh, not only they don't teach Amazigh heritage, but they are also not fairly compensated for their work. So if we go to the next slide. I'd like to speak about how with the ANU, we're exploring the possibility of co-designing a participatory online archive to record oral histories and collective memories and add to the current very, very tiny secondary research that is available uh, on this topic. And so in it, we want to have an accessible digitized sort of taxonomy of symbols. And in addition to secondary research, I worked with eight cooperatives of Amazigh women weavers in Morocco uh, who have contributed to collecting design stories. So here are a few of these stories that we collected. In this photo, you can see actually a pile knot rug by Malika Mohsin, Hasna Zin, Fatih Zin, and Soumi Arzef from cooperative Qasrimoui in Gulmima. And the photo was taken by the Anu. Some of the symbols that you see there are triangles, X's, and the diamond shapes. Um, the triangle is actually an omnipresent symbol in all tribes. It's commonly called Titlfkir, uh, and it represents Tenit, who is the mother goddess of fertility and the moon, and the patron goddess of Carthage, which is a city uh, north of today's Tunisia. Um, and you know, I think it's really powerful to have such a high religious icon that is embedded in like everyday life objects, including rugs and um, and uh, shoes and wearables, and it's just it's everywhere. Even if everything was made for her to be erased, um, the X symbol is called uh, croix in French, which actually means cross. Uh, and its pre-Islamic meaning refers to having legs spread out, representing a sexual act. And it also symbolizes birth. Um, and actually, in today's stories, in Eitenza, it represents a woman preserving her marriage and avoiding divorce. And I think these dichotomies are particularly interesting to me because they really highlight the impact that political conditions had on MSF symbology and their meanings across time and how they changed. Another example of this is the losange or diamond shape. Um, in pre-Islamic times, the symbol represented women and a chain of losange actually could also symbolize contractions before giving birth. But today in Ad Hamza, this metaphor mutated and changed to represent um, the attachment to the origin and hope for the future. And it's so striking to me that despite patriarchy, the origin is a metaphor for women. In the next slide, I would like to uh, keep going here about the archive. I think um, we want to make this archive as you know, a set of possibilities rather than just focusing on what is lacking. And there are endless stories to discover. Um, Amazigh symbology in general is nested in mysticism, spirituality, as well as the everyday life of Amazigh women and their experience of the land. So by nature, it's ultra feminist. Um, also think that Amazigh uh, rugs are powerful tools of collective memory, resistance, and innovation. And, you know, women have had an incredible role at preserving the Amazigh cultural heritage and identity throughout centuries of colonization and patriarchy. But this heritage might not survive without a sustained structural effort from the entire system that has been failing them over the years. And so an online design archive could be an accessible first step toward collecting and preserving Amazigh stories, but we need more. And I really believe that we need to shift our framework of 
understanding history where knowledge production uh, does not only exclusively belong to design heroes or scholars with a terminal degree, but it really belongs to people like Nora and Fatima and Kultum and Kinzad that you see in these um, pictures. I think their knowledge is as valid and they deserve to be recorded. Um, I think because particularly they changed history until today, their voices are especially worthy of being included in design history. And I'm hoping that this archive could amplify women weavers voices and provide the global design community with new ways of understanding design. Thanks y'all. <laughs> very short three slides. <laughs> Thank you so much, Gina, for sharing such important research with us. Um, I'll move on to our next speaker is uh, Peter Fine. Uh, Peter's research focuses on issues of inequality in design in relation to race, sustainability and gender. And tonight, Peter will be discussing two films documenting uh, the lives of two design couples. Um, and remember, if you have any questions, just pop them in the chat box and we'll, uh, we'll get to them at the end. Uh, over to you, Peter. There I am. Everybody can hear me okay. So my presentation examines design practice as gendered work performance and representation in two films documenting the lives of two design couples, male and female, who practice together as design principles over the course of their lives. The films are Eames, the architect and the painter, detailing the design practices and lives of Charles Ray Eames. And design is one of Vignelli, the chronicle of Massimo and Leila Vignelli's life practice together. These documentaries are unique in their presentation of design, allowing the viewer to watch the performance of designing through these figures on film. As a result, they also perform gender as an often implicit factor in design and exhibit the sexual politics of designing. Each film describes the design process as it relates to the domestic lives of each couple in the studio that itself serves as a second home to them and their design teams. These films present the design studio as the stage in which they played out their roles as designers and the dynamics of working and essentially living out their lives in semi-public spaces. These films illuminate the problematic tension arising from heteronormative, heteronormative romantic bonds being realized and displayed in and through design practice. The individual agency of each designer in relation to their partner and the public personas of those partnerships broadly picture gender politics. These films do not simply document design practice, but allow the viewer to absorb the wide ranging pluralistic design practices of these four designers. The two films I'll discuss attempt to divulge some of the influence of the female design principles, but mostly when represented with their male counterparts. Nevertheless, it is this very binary approach to presenting design, design as gendered that reveals many of the implicit assumptions associated with design and its representation. I'm interested in these two films because they express a gender binary, but also because documentary film, documentary film as a form, presents us with a, a sense of realism, an appearance to our eyes of a true accounting of the intimate lives of well-respected designers we may wish to emulate. The form gives us this real or true sense of being in the presence of these designers in a manner that allows us what feels like an intimate look into their lives. If they are a true accounting of those lives, then perhaps these are accurate and factual records of the designers who defined design in the 20th century. Their studio semi-domestic spaces of love and labor filled with surrogate family members draws us deeper into their lives room by room. Archival photographs and footage allows us into an aperture of time as firsthand oral accounts from family, friends, employees, and other contemporaries are juxtaposed with design historians speaking to the record of their practices and the many actors who had agency over the process. The gender binary assumptions of each film by default draw limited attention to the place of women within collaborative design studio practice as designers and the biases they have typically experienced. They are mostly signified by the male designer as adjacent to them even when the design partnership is recognized as breaking with historical assumptions about the abilities of women as designers. Different ways of sharing work and credit, working across multiple disciplines, and through various approaches are assumed to result in these couples sharing of the burdens and rewards of their unique couplings. In the case of the Eames, they are seen participating together as one, not unlike a case study itself, of how to best utilize romantic bonds for professional success and domestic happiness. 
Their work together, questioning how design is work and life and not simply labor, might be equally fulfilling given the constraints of mid-century American design. Constraints such as the general assumption that women could not play an equal role or possessed by virtue of being female, the innate talent and abilities that designers must possess. The, prog the progressivist assumptions of the means about the rapidly increasing role of technology design and everyday life facilitated new material possibilities for the design ambition. It also aggravated the gender divine rather than creating altogether neutral marital space for life and work. Charles is seen, on taking the much seen, is seen taking on the much larger public role in the film when the studio is engaged with corporate clients from large industries. The fact that these were technological giants of their day provides the assumed reasoning at the time supposedly that Charles would occupy this role in the masculine sphere, bringing these firms into the more domestic space of the studio. The film features the studio as a second home and semi-domestic space where messy experimentation and a high degree of ambiguity about designing might occur and in what forms it was encouraged. <clears throat> Excuse me. The struggle then and now even to do, the struggle then and even now to do the credit Ray as an equal in their design partnership provides what is assumed to be the primary tension in the film. Embedded in this is the question and then a partial dismissal of the claims by some former studio employees to a portion of the design credit also. Charles is assumed to be the master quote in their employees as under his tutelage and a role that he perhaps embraced as a highly charismatic figure of desire. A clearly male identified role that as one former employee tells us was quote justifiably exploitative if one was cunning enough to be appreciative of it. In any case, the aims are presented as a singular entity undivided from their work and therefore their studio with all the employees acting with them as an organic whole. The film makes clear that Ray's role diminished over time and with age as the more technocratic clients further dominated their shared practice. This occurs in the film in parallel and perhaps with increasing frequency with Charles' pursuit of other romantic partners, one of which is sympathetically presented and allowed to speak frankly on these matters. That his dalliances might be a product and accepted practice of his movement within the male dominated spheres of work and industry is not broached. Also, whether this can be attributed to the earlier Bohemian circles in which they studied is also not, is also not raised. Both films begin with a journey, the Eames to California and its endless horizons. And on the opposite coast, the Vignelli's move from Italy to New York. We are prompted to see both couples as pioneering together to follow their destinies to the, in the pursuit of the work that will define their partnerships in life and work as one. The film encourages us to see the Vignelli's as we see many European designers who moved to the US in the post-war years as emigres, unbound by the past and destined to bring modernist values to the US. The film about the Eames bookends their life squarely in the center of the 20th century and largely during their most productive years. Design is one largely displays the Vignelli's life and practice together within their last years as still active designers always designing any for the moment. Some sense is given that their moment has passed as the film chronicles their work and 24 hour partnership quote, documented for the camera as they go about to preserve their designs for a permanent center and archive. Regardless of whether the timeliness, like the universality of their work can be convincingly argued, the long, of their, uh, the long arc of their lives is closing. They're clearly positioned to define their own agency as designers within design history and do so seriously. Massimo himself referring on three occasions to his own mortality. We don't see their home since unlike the Eames, they were still living at the time the film was shot. Only the space they created in which they were, they were surrounded by the many objects they designed for work and life. A work life together in a rather aesthetic space in which Massimo sits attired in vestment like clothes of his own design. We are made witness to the clothes of history as the Vignelli's might suppose it to be having weathered the, fashion, the fashions and various superficial trends of design. Many of their long-term clients, many of whom are male, address the camera in business attire seated at their desk in office spaces extolling the profound influence of their work rather subjectively without many specifics. These clients also speak to the duality of the couples as an important aesthetic signifier of the couple, as, a, as an important aesthetic signifier of their work, as important modernists and perhaps to its purity. In at least one case, a client speaks directly to the lack of credit given to Layla. Layla. In another case, the fiery nature of their collaboration is made clear by yet another. In one scene, we see Layla shake her fist at Massimo during preparation with employees of pasta for the midday meal. 
Their clients make clear that they admire the Vignelli's relationship, which from their viewpoint requires conflict in order to collaborate. It is quite clear that Layla is regarded as the voice of reason, the business side, and something of a shadow partner to many. Certainly from a graphic design history point of view, her contributions are largely absent from the discussion of their studio success. We see their present workspace now mostly empty of the large staff. It was once meant to employ in support of their life and work together as a couple. The labor saving benefits of digital design having eliminated the need for a large production staff and perhaps billable hours are in decline. One client comments on the total lack of any personal items within the studio, even when a large staff had been present, except in the case of Massimo's office. In both cases, the studio space serves as a living showroom of their design, work and life in the modular systems of their design, their interior architecture and individual objects. I don't want to suggest that the experience of these films is at all disagreeable. In fact, seeing these couples come to life on screen along with their work is, is in many ways a form of wish fulfillment for myself at least. Seeing many of their designs existing and being realized within the context of their lives and practice reminds me of how often I've taken for granted their work as a staging of much of my own. Indeed, the persuasive nature of the, of the documentary form makes this experience more pleasurable, not unlike the hidden hand of design in all of our lives. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, we've got a slight change to our programme tonight. So our next speaker is uh, Katharina Dorr, a graphic designer and writer whose research explores uh, relationships to relationship to objects from a queer feminist perspective. And tonight, Katharina will be discussing the question of whether objects have a gender. Uh, so I will pass over to you, Catherine. Katharina. Hello. <laughs> Sorry, I have to do a, a quick uh, room change. <laughs> so now I'm, I'm uh, here. Uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, thank you for the introduction and the invitation. Uh, I would also prefer to have the first slide. So the introduction slide first. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Katarina, and I'm presenting you my research, writing, and design project, The Gender of Objects. Uh, I started in the year 2020 in my master's at University of the Arts in Berlin. Uh, and before I start, I want to make clear that when I'm using the term men and women, female and male, femininity and masculinity, I'm always talking about a social construct of gender. So my first touch with gender theory was in media theory, where we discussed about gender roles in films. And also that the lighting, camera position, filters, and the view on bodies are gendered. So we find a lot about our idea of femininity and masculinity in films already subtle in their technical settings. But also other design things are somehow gendered. For example, toilets and their signs are clearly made by the binary idea of gender. Toys um, are mainly made for girls and boys and also buildings um, can be seen through this filter. Analyzing those things show us a lot about our socialization. How are things made? From and for whom are they made? Where are they placed? And what happens to us using those things? And now I can please the next slide or the first slide. <laughs> so Friedrich von Boris, a design theories, theorist, as well as Uta Brandes, a gender design theorist say, that everything we design is influenced by what we have learned. At the same time, all those things we have designed, design us back. That means if we always stay in the cycle of designing and be designed, we will reproduce and be produced by all the norms we have learned again and again. And within the cycle, you can see on the left-hand side, we are with our things influenced by a constructed idea of gender and also class, race, age, religion, and health involving the discrimination of those who don't fit in the norm. Like Brandes and von Boris, I believe that we as designer has the, designers have the responsibility to interrupt the cycle, to understand and rethink those constructs in a world made out of human-made objects, buildings, clothes, films, icons, photographs, and more, with the aim to expanding the given especially in a world that was for too many years and still is ongoing mainly made and normed by white cis men, 
has missed many different important perspectives of non-white cis male people. So the world is made in a certain way, while it can be different, we just need to question it. So when I started my research, I was hoping to find a way interrupting my own cycle of reproducing. First of all, I needed to understand in which cycle I am, together with others, in a society that is for decades influenced by patriarchal structures. While this self-reflection, my research on gender, art and design, and through talking to people, I observed that we don't just separate and categorize people in a binary system as male or female. We also do this with objects, no matter if they are consciously gendered design or not. We put them in this heteronormative order as well. So I decided to write essays in German um, about objects and to focus my research on a question. Do objects have gender? This comes with further questions. Which objects, objects do we associate as male or female? Why is that and how can it be changed? And, why, and what does all of this have to do with design? So now I open up the field of the semiotics. That's, that's a linguistic term and means the teaching of signs and within the meaning of things. Roland Barthes, a philosopher and writer said that every object carries a so-called sign in which it takes on meaning for us. As example, he brings up a telephone that carries the sign of communication. Barthes notes that an object can also carry more than one sign of meaning. So you can see on the right-hand side of my slide. The phone might be seen as a sign for communication, but also for availability, distance, or proximity. And an object can carry different meanings, depending, depending on the recipient of the object. But for example, associated a phone with femininity, while I didn't. So also for Bart, there's the fact that we see a meaning in an object depending on what we have learned in our society but also on the time when the object was placed or analyzed. Some objects might be senseless for some, while for others it's super important. And some might, might be seen, oh, sorry. <laughs> In some objects we might see a sign that others can't see. In some objects we all see the same. That's why I've chosen for my essays, also seen as thought experiments, some objects of my personal socialization that are somehow associated as male or female from my suspected view, but also from others, artists, friends, theorists. For example, a teapot, a hammer, a vacuum cleaner and salt and pepper container. Next slide, please. Because of my knowledge as designer, I separated objects for my analysis in their characteristics to get a better understanding why an object seems to be more feminine or masculine. So all objects are constructed by their function, material, color, shape, naming, where they are placed, in which relation they are to as humans, as well in relation to each other and of which group of people they are used and in which social construct this group is classified. Even one characteristic can transport a sign of gender. For example, a heavy object of steel might seem to be more male than an object out of porcelain. And this is because we have learned what feminine and masculine means and which characteristics we, we connect with these categories. But, and this is the most important part of my research and is based on gender and queer theories, mainly by Judith Butler. Uh, if we understand how and why we categorize like that, we understand our way of thinking and within this, we are able to change our heteronormative thinking and acting. You can see on the left-hand side on the bottom. So to be able to de- and reconstruct gender norms through objects or their context in which they are placed, I mix the objective study on an object and subjective use in my object analysis with gender, art and design history and theories to get a better understanding and the highest amount of perspectives. To give you an example, 
I had a talk with my professor about my research. We had dinner and she said, look, salt and pepper are a really good example for your investigation. I knew directly what she meant. For me, was, for me salt was female and pepper male, but at the same time, I had no idea where this comes from. I started to analyze the salt shaker and the pepper grinder of our kitchen. Um, German kitchen, by the way. <laughs> and the characteristics I found couldn't be more obvious, categorized as male and female. So our salt shaker is small, lightweight, out of glass, transparent, almost invisible, easy to use with a slight tilt. Our pepper grinder was the complete opposite. Huge, heavyweight, also heavy to use because you actually need to use your arm muscles. You can see it in the picture on the, the first picture on the slide. Uh, it's out of massive wood outside and had a metal middle inside and totally not to be overlooked in the shelf. Also in other, mainly German kitchens, when salt and pepper was not designed in the same shape and material, salt was always the female version of pepper, as you can see in the pictures. It seems that it wasn't just me and my professor who made the separation or we were already influenced by those designs. But with the look on gender theory, it might be more. We know at least from Judith Butler and many more before and after that a heterosexual couple, woman and man in this combination, seen, to, seen as the norm, have to be at the same time the opposite of each other in this normative thinking, like opposites attract. This idea is based on the historical social construct of the body and mind dualism that separates male and female as opposites that belong together as whole and justifies gender hierarchy since then. It also fixes the idea that there is no other gender possible in this combination or two of the same kind in this relation. Through this, I realized I mainly see salt and pepper as female and male because of their relation to each other. One salt shaker alone is for me a simple sign of food and tasting and not at all as female. Bart wrote in his text that we see objects always in a system of objects. Their sign always in relation to each other. But when we, for example, take the object away of its usual context or expand the system of this object, the sign of the object might change. Next slide, please. So salt and pepper are of course just two of many herbs and spices. Seeing all of them together, my interpretation of masculinity and femininity on salt and pepper containers almost disappear in their broader system. And even if they still exist, it's totally unclear which gender a chili, oregano or curry container would have and also if salt and pepper are clearly female or male anymore. So in the German kitchen is no such a design yet for a whole system of herbs and spices because it's always focused on pepper and salt, on men and women, where there's such a broad spectrum of spices. But if we open our mind having a wide spectrum of different gender identities seen in a wide spectrum of containers, Gender is thought more broadly and many different new combinations of containers might be possible that are beside the binary system of gender. Thank you.